Welcome to Dear Sandy. I'm Sandy Galef, a member of the New York State Assembly, representing parts of Northern Westchester and parts of Putnam County. And today we have a great show. Um, this is an update at T-Town. And um, we are going to start with, uh, I'm going to introduce my, my two guests. Uh, first, Kevin Carter, who is the Executive Director of T-Town. It's Great to have you here, Kevin. Well, it's great to be here. Always nice to see Good. you, Sandy. We love being on your show, and hopefully this will be a fun one today. Right. And I don't know whether we can see my other guest, but Erin Baker is the Animal Care Supervisor for the environment, as an environmental educator, and uh, we welcome you here, Erin. Um, T-Town, just l let's get this wonderful activity that's going to be happening at T-Town that's been going on for many years. Uh, Eagle Fest. Tell us a little bit about Eagle Fest. Eagle, Eagle Fest is just uh, right around the corner. Um, it's on February 6th at Croton Point Park. Um, it's really a fantastic and unique event um, for the whole family. And um, we get... Uh, you know, several thousand people. We've had as many as 5,000 people come to Eagle headquarters at Croton Point Park. Um, it's an opportunity to see eagles not only in the wild, um, but the incredible bird, bird of prey shows we have to see a bald eagle up close and personal. Um, there's activities for, for the kids. Um, it's a wonderful festive environment. We're really cranking up the festive aspect this year. So there's uh, wonderful food from uh, Glen, Glen Vogt uh, of River Market. Um, and we have a tent with live music, regional artists uh, performing live music all day. So it's a really, really terrific event uh, to come out and um, to see these amazing animals, our, our national symbol, to see them really um, up close and personal. So well, we're looking forward I've to loved it. it. Every time I've gone, it's just so much fun. And uh, for people under the tent, it's nice and warm. Yeah. Hopefully you don't get snow, but right. sometimes we do. But being on the Hudson River and, and knowing actually that a lot of eagles are flying up and down absolutely. the Hudson River during that time. Yeah, Absolutely, yeah. It's really the eagle spotting even right there at, uh, at the uh, Croton Point Park and at the boat launch is really terrific. So um, it's, it's really something that you'll remember your whole life. And uh, so mm -hmm. we, we encourage everybody who's, who's not been to Eagle Fest to come and those who have been to, to come again, and we promise you'll see something really amazing that you'll never forget. People are going to see something amazing on my TV show because I've never had birds yeah. <laughs> on my television show. So Erin is here, and she's here with this wonderful looking owl. Right. Um, should we turn to Erin and she can tell us a little bit about um, what's, what's the name of the owl that you have there? His name is Kajika, and Kajika is a barred owl who he came to T-Town from the state of North Carolina, but they are living and residing in New York, um, uh, all across the Northeast and even into the western part of the country as well. So barred owls are not uncommon, although they do require certain types of habitat in order for them to find places to raise their families. At T-Town, we have some nice habitat where we do have barred owls nesting, um, and it's one of the reasons why we need to protect areas like T-Town. But we also teach at T-Town that it's important to consider these as our neighbors even in our own backyards because we have lots of birds of prey like owls mm -hmm. and hawks living all around us. This owl is with us because he has an injury and he should be out in the wild and he was mm -hmm. once but he was hit by a car years ago. So is that, that why, that's why he came up, yes. up here? Yeah, so if someone encounters an injured bird of prey, we are not actually a rehab center at T-Town, so we're not the destination to bring an injured bird, but we often get that misunderstanding, and so we help to redirect people to where they can properly get a bird that needs that kind of help. And then the first step is to try and get that bird well so that it can be returned to the wild. Mm -hmm. That would be the best outcome. And then the second best outcome, like in Kajika's case, if they heal so they feel well but they can't hunt or fly, um, they wouldn't survive on their own, then hopefully they can find placement at a place like T-Town. Mm -hmm. And so Kajika's been with us now for about four years and mm -hmm. his job now instead of catching mice out there is to teach children about what they do out in the wild and why we need to protect all the places where they live, right around where we do too. So children come in uh -huh. um, to visit T-Town and say one of, the, one of the, the famous people at T-Town, I guess, is Kajika. Yes, yes. And um, so what are they, are the kids in awe of having an owl right next to them? How do Absolutely. They feel? So it works a couple ways. You can come to T-Town and you can visit and you can see where he lives and visit him at his home in an outdoor enclosure and our mm -hmm. other birds who pray as well. But if you come to one of our programs or if your child is in a school where we do a program, 
for them. They either come on a field trip to T-Town, we also travel to the schools in many cases, and we want to teach kids about the wildlife that live around here and environmental issues that are happening in our backyards, but they're just words to the kids. Mm -hmm. And when I bring out an owl like this, it gives them something they can directly connect with. And it's just, even adults, I think everyone, it's just very moving to meet a bird like this mm -hmm. that we just don't get this experience very often to see one this close. And I think it has much greater impact on the education that we're trying to get out there. Mm -hmm. I think it's more memorable. And I think it also develops more empathy and compassion as well for the people, children and adults to want to care mm -hmm. about these birds, about the places that they live and why we should value and protect them. Aaron, I'm watching Kajika. Uh-huh. Um, and he's turning his head, <laughs> doing something that I can't do. Yeah. Uh, I think it turned almost all the way around to the back while you were talking. Yeah, and, and so he'll why do is that. that. And it's something, it's, I get asked that all the time. Um, and I teach kids often about adaptations in the programs that we do. And owls are very uniquely adapted to hunt with sight and sound. And so their sight is adapted in such a way that they hunt in the dark. So what he has, and it's a little hard to appreciate, is he has great big eyes that in his head take up most of the volume of his skull. But he has a lot of feathers that make his head have this illusion of being even larger in size. But you'll have to trust me that if we took all the feathers away, his head's about the size of a lime, his eyeballs take up most of the space inside. Mm -hmm. And so what he can't do with eyes that large that see in the dark that help him do what we can't, we can do something he can't do. His eyes don't have the muscles to pivot around in the skull. So you can keep your head still and you can look all mm -hmm. around. And an owl can't do that. Oh. So those eyes uniquely adapted for seeing in the dark, if he wants to look around, he has to physically move his head wherever he wants to look. And so we have this vision, this impression of owls always spinning their heads around because that's what they have to do just to look at their surroundings. And in addition, they have more bones in their neck. So they physically can move their heads farther than we can in almost a full circle, as he said, 270 degrees. Wow, he's so relaxed. Is that a normal for being on television? <laughs> He's a wild owl and if I were to try and touch him or pet him he would show you that he didn't like that. He might try to bite. Um, I respect him for what he is. That never changes. He lives with us. I love him very much. It doesn't reciprocate and that's okay with me. He's a wild animal and what he has learned to do as a bird coming out of the wild who suffered an injury and has adjusted is he's learned to trust me as someone that isn't a predator that isn't going to hurt him and in addition, the group of children or adults that we're meeting, that it's something that he can do and be calm doing. And he's really adjusted quite nicely. He's been doing this now for a total of about eight years. So um, he's well practiced at this, although I will say it's the first movie set I think he has visited. All right, well, and he seems to enjoy the surroundings. This is the first, the nice lights and, and yeah. the uh, yeah. the dark setting here. Kevin, we heard some noise though a minute ago, I think. Yeah, that was uh, <laughs> one of our other animal ambassadors uh, that Aaron brought that we'll uh, get to meet in just a moment. He uh, was just a little restless over here. Um, we have a, a red tail hawk that we're going to meet in just, oh. just a moment. Um, the, the amazing thing about these animal ambassadors is um, the magic that they weave um, in, in terms of the, of the programs when we do educational mm -hmm. programs. And at T-Town, we, you know, really that's, that's what we're about. We're about environmental education. Um, we reach over 20,000 people, children and adults, a year through these programs. And the animal ambassadors are a huge part of that. Um, as Aaron said, they, they have a way of um, just sparking the curiosity within people, um, creating space within them. And, and once they're open, then a, a lot, all kinds of interesting learning can occur. They're learning about their own environment. They're learning about the fact that you know, everything that they do has an impact on that environment. And um, they come to respect it, I think, in a new way uh, through that relationship. Mm -hmm. Are we going to see other owls at the Eagle Fest? Yep. Uh, one of the great things about Eagle Fest is you get a, a different glimpse at um, birds of prey um, and uh, as a whole. And so there'll be um, handlers from all over the Northeast come to Eagle Fest. Um, you'll get to actually see up close a bald eagle, a golden eagle, hawks, owls, f falcons of many varieties. And you'll un learn about where they come from and what distinguishes them. Um, the opportunity to see a bald eagle uh, up, up close is quite special. Um, they 
um, are not usually um, able to be on the glove. There are very few that can be. And we actually have a bald eagle at T-Town, uh, Griffin. Those who have uh, been to T-Town may have seen Griffin. Um, we can't take him out, though. He can't be on the glove. It's very hard. And Erin, when she brings out our, um, our red tail hawk in just a moment, she can tell us a little bit more about why that is. Um, but if you come to Eagle Fest, you'll be able to see a, a, a bald eagle up close, as close as uh, you are to me right now, which is pretty, pretty I magical. I remember sitting there yeah. and just, I, I was so close to the, the birds. And if, if you weren't right there, they walked down, uh, the, you know, the trainers took them down mm -hmm. the aisles and you really felt the magnificence of each one of these birds. And then, you know, as, as, as their wings go out, I mean, it's wonderful. I think we're going to see some wings now. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I have a so, feeling. Yeah, yeah, we're going to meet our next... Uh, Erin, how hard is this to get out the hawk? Oh, I think, you know, she's just, her name is Blaze. Blaze. And I think it's a twofold name for her. She's a red-tailed hawk, so initially we thought it was suiting to name her that because of her reddish-brown tail. And then as we got to know her a little more as she settled in, we felt it even more fitting because for a red-tailed hawk, she's got a bit of a fiery personality. But that said, she's gotten very good at what she does, although she sometimes likes to test her wings out. Um, and we may see that today if she comes out. Sometimes, though, she surprises me and she comes out nice and calm. But Has however, she been she's in a TV studio out. before? She hasn't, and she's ready to okay. meet you guys. I can tell she's sounding kind of restless. Right. So let's see what kind of mood she's so in. So here comes Blaze. Yeah. There we go. Oh, aren't you beautiful, Blaze? And so she oh. is, well, we, I say she, and that's mm -hmm. an educated guess because of her size. Because with birds of prey, the females are about one third larger than the males on average. And she's definitely a, a good size red tail hawk. She's on the upper end of the size. So that's why we're making a guess that she's a female. And she came out rather calm, which was is she, nice. She looks like she's looking around to see what the atmosphere is here. Yeah, she is. She's looking, you can see she's looking around at the lights right now and mm -hmm. seeing her surroundings. And what I'll probably do in a minute or so once she settles is I brought a little bit of her lunch today. And this is one of the ways that we work with these birds when they're wild birds and we bring them to meet audiences. Mm -hmm. um, and earlier in their training as well, what we do is for a bird who is very food motivated, like a bird of prey, we travel mm -hmm. with their food, we offer them their food and we go somewhere. And it helps to build that trust and mm -hmm. helps them to be more calm when we go and we travel to programs. Should I ask what kind of food she gets? We do not feed her chicken nuggets or hot dogs, as kids like that. <laughs> oh, okay. They are carnivores, strict right. carnivores, no vegetables in the diet, but that said, they have to eat the whole food. It's important uh -huh. for them to get proper nutrition. So we have to feed them all the organs, the feathers, the fur, mm -hmm, the bones, mm -hmm. whatever animals they eat in the wild. Not mm -hmm. that we have to feed them exactly the same species, but we have to feed them a whole food diet. So what I have here are some rodents that are not alive. Um, I often mm -hmm. say our freezer at T-Town looks very different from yours at home, although it's stocked with meat, if you are not a vegetarian, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So what we have are for her some mouse pieces, which you can see she's looking at that and she's probably uh -huh. gonna say, oh, yum, yum, time oh, for lunch. Okay. And well, there goes the mouse yeah. I didn't want in my house. Okay. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> well, and see, this, this is their purpose. It's why I think it's also nice to show this, is you can see what their role is in nature mm -hmm. as a top predator. And so people often say, too, that we're interested in the species that are more rare. It, for example, bald eagles. I love Eagle Fest because it's a celebration of a bird that is amazing and beautiful, and we were close to losing. And it's a happy story mm -hmm. we get to celebrate now that they've come back. But I also remind people, too, that it's not just, oh, that one didn't sit well. <laughs> She's got to reorganize its position. <laughs> so it's not always a glamorous job sometimes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Being a top predator comes with its messes sometimes. Did to get through there now? Yeah, I, guess so. I think she's good now. Right. <laughs> I don't no want to share your food, so you can keep it with you over there. <laughs> Every once in a while, I get a flung with some of her lunch. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> But as, as I was saying, red-tailed hawks being a very common species, it's the common species in our environment that are really important as well because mm -hmm. they do so much to provide balance to the ecosystem. They're the ones doing a lot of the hard work out there. And red-tailed hawks, for us, certainly, they're having a, a large effect on the rodent populations. And not that mice and rats are bad. Everything has their place, but anything in too high numbers is out of balance. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's their job. And for them, although they're more common, they're also the number one type of bird of prey to become injured because they're taking greater risk living around us. So the more we learn how to be good neighbors, 
the more we can minimize those kinds of mishaps. So it's easier for them to live in a place that doesn't have a huge population? Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, although they're very adaptable. So although it's easier, maybe safer for them to live somewhere where there's less mm -hmm. people, you do frequently find them living in places where there's a lot of people because they have to spread out their territories from each other. And they're willing to live in an area where there's fewer trees, there's more homes, there's mm -hmm. backyards. Um, they'll use that incredible eyesight of theirs to look for a mouse, maybe scan at the edge of a road, perhaps, mm -hmm. or your backyard. And they can see a mouse up to a mile away with those eyes. So they mm -hmm. do like clear areas where they have good visibility. And um, power lines can be a hazard to them as right. well as roads. Yes. Right. The things that we put outside, sometimes rodent poisons and things of that uh -huh. nature that we put out, we're affecting wildlife. So these are the right. kinds of information we try to share with the public, the things that we do in our backyards that mm -hmm. do affect animals like this, that they don't stay at T-Town, they live where mm -hmm. we live as well. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so quite how a did she come to T-Town? She came to us, if you look closely, you'll see that her right wing, how it droops a little lower than yes, her left. Right. Uh -huh. So uh, you wanna see symmetry when you look at a bird that's healthy when they're at rest, and you don't see that with her. So that shows us that her right wing is where her injury is, and she was, they think, hit by a car. She was found at only a few months old, she'd probably fledged the nest, maybe just for a couple months, and um, she was found at the site of a road in Pennsylvania. So first mm -hmm. she went to a rehab center, Tamarack Wildlife Rehab Center in Pennsylvania. She recovered there. A falconer actually helped with her recovery and training her. And unfortunately, the bones just didn't set properly that she can fly, but it's very mm -hmm. limited. She can't get sustained flight. She can't get up and actually circle mm -hmm. around. She wouldn't be able to hunt. She can, can fly within a cage? Yes, she, she can she fly does. within the enclosure. And one of the things I do with her exercise a little bit is I feed her every day on the glove, me and another staff member at T-Town. And it keeps her used to working with me, those of mm -hmm. us that handle mm -hmm. her. Um, she's every day working with us, coming to our glove. And we'll give her a little exercise by having her fly a little farther, help her mm -hmm. use those muscles a little bit and exercise a bit within her ability, of course. Mm -hmm. What kind of wingspan does she have? She has about a four four and a half foot wingspan. Right. So almost as tall as me. Uh huh. <laughs> She's very calm. She, was, she hasn't been calm on the set in her cage. No, she was ready to come out <laughs> and meet us, but I think that's what she wanted. I think she wanted, you know, she travels in that box and it's like a blinder or a hood. She can't see outside of it and it helps to keep her calm. But when she comes out, she can see kind of where she is, get a feel for her surroundings. And the more that we do this with her too, the more comfortable mm -hmm. she gets with these kinds of diverse roles that she now has with us. So, we how could. Many, how many birds do you have? At, we at have T10? 13 birds of prey that 13? live okay. with us. Of course, there's many wild ones on our property that if you mm -hmm. hike, you might see if you're fortunate. But there are 13 that we do take care of, all of which, of course, are permanently injured and with us for life. She's great. She's great. Uh, thank you so very, very much. You're Does welcome. she have anything more to say to us? I think she's point? had her lunch and she's ready for her nap afterwards. Oh, she looks nice and relaxed. It. Thank you very much for having us here. You're this very was welcome. our treat, and thank you so much for the chance to talk about such a wonderful event that we have coming up at Tea Time. Right. So, Kevin, again, what's that date for that wonderful Eagle Fest? Uh, Eagle Fest is on February 6th. Which is a Saturday, which right? Which is a Saturday. We have a, a snow date, which we hopefully won't need to use. Right, right. Um, but uh, February 6th, and um, you can go to www.ttown.org. Um, to learn about the event, this wonderful event. Um, we get people from all over, so we have people coming up from New York City, they can take the Eagle Train, um, which is a special train that has uh, guest naturalists on the train, and they, they oh can spot goodness. birds along the Hudson on the trip up. Oh, um, wow. And we also this year have a southbound uh, Eagle Train uh, from Poughkeepsie. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a wonderful day for, for the whole family. So um, we hope that you'll all come out and enjoy um, this really, really special day. We promise you won't forget it. Right, and I can testify that it's, it's <laughs> great. It's just wonderful. Yeah. And then you have lots of displays of all kinds of uh, environmental activities that are going on. Lots well, that's of right. organizations. Absolutely. We're very, one of the things we're really proud about Eagle Fest is that it's, um, it's a collaborative uh, effort. We have over 30 organizations that participate, um, various chapters of the Audubon Society, um, organ great organizations like Wave Hill um, and Scenic Hudson. Um, it, it's just a, a Greenberg Nature Center. So many organizations um, participating in this, in this great day. Um, and as Erin said, it's, 
it's not often that you get these days you get to celebrate a wonderful environmental success story like the return to health of, mm -hmm. of the bald eagle. And in that way, it's very hopeful for people that what you do does really matter and you can make a difference. Right, instead of letting our animals and birds go to the extinct category. Oh, that's right. Yes, that's we're exactly keeping right. them going, especially the eagle when you think about our country. That's oh. that's we we can't lose those. That's right. This is a <laughs> this is a majestic animal and you know a lot of people we find um, when we're out and about, a lot of people are surprised to find that not only do they come here uh, to Westchester, um, to the Hudson River every year, but they're, they're here in great numbers and you can really, um, you can experience them. And this is a very special way to mm -hmm. experience them. So um, it's, uh, it's one of those things where we will want ever ask everybody to spread the word because it's uh, it's quite special and it's very inspirational. Right. Well, I remember going to T Town when I first moved to Austin, and my children so much enjoyed um, being there. And we do some of the nature trails. And uh, as an adult, I love going to Wildflower Island and so on. But but tell the audience in case they haven't been there, kind of like. Where is T-Town position? It's, it's not necessarily where you pass by all the time. <laughs> well, T-Town so. is, um, is an amazing place. Uh, the preserve itself is um, over 1,000 acres. Uh, we have 15 miles of trails, um, including our newest trail, which is called the Twin, Twin Lakes Trail. Um, some of you might have heard about that because we got a lot of great press this year when we opened it up and we were uh, named one of the, great, the best places. We were named uh, by Westchester Magazine, uh, the top hike, hiking destination. We've been getting a lot of the fall and the winter uh, wonderful times to hike all year round. Um, and, uh, but T-Town is it's a magical place in that way. The preserve is very special. But what makes it even more special is, um, is that it's, we have a mission to inspire our community to lifelong environmental stewardship. And we do that through education, through our wonderful education team. Uh, you met uh, one of our incredible staff today, Aaron Baker. Um, it's our education team, our stewardship team. You know, they're uh, dedicated uh, day in and day out to that to that challenge of what it really means to inspire people uh, and what it, to what it um, really means to be a lifelong environmental steward. So um, a, a variety of programs, uh, uh, school children coming on field trips, uh, programs uh, with working with towns to help inform them on uh, land use decisions that they uh, make, doing a, a after school um, enrichment um, all over the county. Um, these programs are um, so impactful and uh, that's really what our uh, what the core of our mission is. So it starts with being inspired by the place, the sense of magic that comes with the place, um, and then you're able to just go go deeper um, and learn more and hopefully be inspired to be that lifelong uh, right. steward. Well, you've also started new, well, it's been there for a little while, but working with some of the high school students um, in, in, in environmental programs, really in-depth, mm -hmm. scientific, research and so on. That must be a lot of fun working oh, it's with amazing. The teenagers. Yeah, it's amazing. And as you mentioned, you know, one of the things that's amazing um, about this area, and I think about about Ossining um, and the amazing research program at Ossining High School, um, well, one of the areas where we, that we've started a relatively new program, well, it's only a few years in existence, is uh, the T-Town Environmental Science Academy. And it came into being because uh, one of our staff members, Dr. Mike Rubo, realized, wow, there's all these kids studying science here and this, this incredible uh, research program at the high school, what are they doing during this during the summer? Mm -hmm. Is there something for them? And a lot of those kids are in, in the environmental sciences. More and more young people are fascinated, intrigued by this area of study. Um, so we began this T-Town Environmental Science Academy during the month of, of July, and we allow those kids to come and do learn what it's like to do real world scientific research uh, with um, Dr. Mike Rubo and his team at T-Town and they get to ch uh, pick a project and work on that project and then really present it and uh, it's just amazing to watch these kids they are so intrepid they are so sharp I they know are. you I don't have to they tell are. you I know you've seen them in action <laughs> they know more about anything that I've never I've never even thought about the issue amazing. it's amazing they're so in-depth with their science scientific research and it's so great yeah and we're now uh, working in a partnership with Pace University um, they have a tremendous uh, school in terms of environmental science and environmental studies um, but they don't necessarily have a place like T-Town so so these are with the college students that's then. right yeah, yeah becoming a we've piloted a program where we're becoming a resource for them to be able to come out and do field work. Um, mm -hmm. So we're really excited about these kinds of, of partnerships 
um, you know, any way that we can really fill a need that's going to um, give us that maximum impact. And um, so it's a, really a continuum through life. It starts with programs for very young children. And you have the camp programs for very young children. That's right. right? right? That's right. So it's a continuum. It starts at a very young age, um, but we want to make sure that, um, that there's opportunities throughout life for people to reconnect with the natural mm -hmm. world um, and to really consider and contemplate what it means to to steward it. And um, I think, um, you know, we're, our work, we, we feel like our work is never done, um, but this, the place is a, uh, has a wonderful energy and we, we draw a lot from the place itself. Mm -hmm. I remember, I mean, then you have these new problems like invasive species. Absolutely. Well, I guess they've been around for a while, but they're more invasive now. Right. There's more of them. But I remember being on, on one slope where you had people trying to take some of this stuff out yeah. so that it didn't take over all your property. And that's that's another, I mean, people are finding that now on the highways and in their gardens. That's and right. And as you said, it's very much a, a work in progress. You know, people that we don't have a... a uh, an easy cure for this, an easy remedy, but mm -hmm. you know, like most problems, when you get people working together and communicating, um, that's where you're going to fig figure these things out. Um, biodiversity is obviously a really a core value for T-Town, preserving the uh, amazing biodiversity that we have, and teaching people to have respect for uh, mm -hmm. preserving the biodiversity. So um, these these uh, in invasive species that um, that we see, uh, whether it's you know Barbary or the Japanese stilt grass or the black swallowwort, these are some of the ones that are really common at T-Town. Um, you know, we're not, um, we're basically, we're, we're, we're addressing this because it's, um, because it's a threat to the biodiversity mm -hmm. that's, that's so important for life. So, um, you know, we don't have the answer, but we want to be a convener um, mm -hmm. and we want to um, make sure that we are connecting with the best practices and the best knowledge mm -hmm. that's out there. Um, and I wish we had the answer for these inv invasive species. Um, um, we don't quite have it yet, but we're still, we're still mm -hmm. working hard on it. But, but a lot of what you do is also from the experimentation or, or the work that you're doing, you work with the local officials so that you're conveying that to them because they're working with some of the same issues in a very different way. It might be in their local parks or whatever. That's absolutely right, yeah. So the management issues that they're dealing with, we, it's, it's really a lot, it's, it's, so, it's so important, you know, I'm sure you, you, you see this in your work every day, but convening a dialogue, meaningful dialogue mm -hmm. is so important. So that, that program, our ELLA program, um, it's the Environmental Leaders Learning Alliance, and that's where you know we engage with these various towns and with these um, with folks that are sometimes confronted with making you know land use decisions or site plan decisions, and that's not their area of expertise. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you know bringing them together, connecting them up with resources like um, like uh, Dr. Mike at T Town is very important. Right. I just want to thank you so much, Kevin, for being here and uh, and having Erin come. She oh. kind of slipped slipped back with with the birds, but um, you know, between the two of you, you just give us a wonderful review of what T Town does for all of us, but also this very special Eagle Fest coming up uh, in February yes. on February sixth, Saturday, 6th. February sixth. February 6th. We hope to see everyone there. Thank you, Sandy. So thank you for having us on. It was it's always a pleasure. Thanks so very much, and thank you all for watching. If you have any questions at all about what we've talked about, obviously I'm not going to tell you about the birds, but I will <laughs> convey your, your questions to T-Town. But thank you so very much for watching. Uh, see you at Eagle Fest. Thanks.